All right, let's go and review some things we talked about in our last couple of lessons. We've been talking about uniform circular motion. Audrey, what is that? Good motion in a circular path at a constant speed. Uh, we said that as an object is at this constant speed, it's not at a constant velocity, it's always accelerating in which direction, Kendall? Um, inward. inward toward the toward the, toward the center. And that word that means toward the center of the circle mean is mm, the other one. Centripetal. So what is that, Michael? Centripetal. Centripetal acceleration. Of course, acceleration only happens because there's something that pulls inward. So what causes centripetal acceleration, class? Centripetal. centripetal force. What was our equation for centripetal acceleration, Kendall? How about centripetal acceleration? It starts with A sub C. There we go. And centripetal force, Audrey. Uh, F sub C equals MV squared over R. Now, it's very probable that a word problem would not necessarily ask you find the centripetal force. Because centripetal force is a name for other pre existent forces. What were some of those forces we said could be centripetal? Name all the ones you can remember. Michael? Inertia. Um, no. A centripetal force. Tension. tension could be a centripetal force, right? If we're swinging something around. So the problem I say find the tension, well, what it really means is find the centripetal force because this for tension is the centripetal force. How about another one? Gravity. Okay, gravity in the case of like a planet going around uh, the sun or the moon going around Earth or any planet, you know, celestial body moving around or even a satellite, I suppose, to an extent uh, orbiting the Earth. So an orbiting body could have centripetal force be that gravitational pull. Uh, Kendall, any others? Friction. Friction. For anytime anything is moving along a surface in a circular path, there's a friction force. Uh, I still remember, um, I was in, I don't know, did any of y'all do Awana when you were younger? Okay. I, um, Awana, it, it's still around, it's just, you know, some of their doctrinal stances changed, so a lot of the conservative Baptist churches ditched it. Some of them still use it. But we did Awana when I was little, and so we had a nice, slick, old gym floor that wasn't really used very much anymore, so they didn't keep it up. And uh, so there wasn't a lot of traction. And there was this circle, it was probably, I don't know, maybe the size of this room wide, but still, I mean, you're running as fast as you can, and by, you know, by the time you get to fifth or sixth grade, I mean, you can, you can move, but not if you can't get traction, right? That slipperiness, right? It was hard to run fast because you kept slipping. You didn't get that push that you wanted. Uh, it's one of the reasons why um, you know, track athletes will wear spikes that dig down into the track a little bit, especially on a rubber track, uh, to give themselves the ability to make the turns even faster and propel themselves quicker. So, yeah, friction certainly could be a centripetal force. Um, any others? Audrey? One more we looked at. It was our race car. Remember, we said we didn't want him just to go around the curve, but to help him go around the curve fast, we would yeah, bank the roadway so there would be some weight in the X component down toward the center as well. And that would be a centripetal force also. So talked about all of that. Uh, then we moved on to uh, a type of motion that is repeated over and over again after the same lapse of time. And any motion that's repeated after the same lapse of time, Michael, is called? Periodic motion. Now, if that periodic motion not only repeats itself after the same lapse of time, but also is repeated over the same path over and over again, that would be called Audrey? Oscillatory. oscillatory motion. Oscillatory motion with the silent C. So that oscillation refers to a motion back and forth along the same path. Um, we were looking specifically yesterday at the spring, right? We have the, uh, the object on the spring, and we're allowing it to oscillate on the spring. And one of the things that affected how rapidly an object will oscillate on a spring um, was the thickness of the spring, the strength of the spring, or class we called it the... 
How do we quantify the strength or fitness of any sort of elastic device? Even a rubber band, we did this way back in chapter five. We have that spring constant represented with the letter K, the spring constant. And uh, so here we have a thicker spring. It's got a significant spring constant. Here we have a lighter spring. And um, it's uh, moving a lot slower, right? Because it's got not as strong. It has a lower spring constant. How do we find letter K? That was the next equation for you here in chapter 10. Uh, what is that equation for K? You can look at your notes as needed. We didn't have homework last night to review or practice with it. So, good. And Audrey's like, I don't need review. I got this. Mg over x. What were our units then for the spring constant? There's two different types of units we could use. Kendall, mm -hmm. units per meter, or the other one, Michael, um, kilograms per second, second squared. Either of these units could be used for the spring constant. We said that the spring constant that affects uh, the time it takes to oscillate, right? As we look at this, if we're kind of thinking and we got... And um, whereas with this one, this, the thicker spring, it's not a lot faster because it's not a lot thicker spring, but it's a little bit faster, right? And uh, so the spring constant makes a difference. There was something else that affected the, uh, the, the uh, time it takes to oscillate. Uh, what was the other factor? Do you remember? Yeah, the, the mass or the weight, we're thinking of the mass specifically, but the weight in question, right? This one's oscillating much more quickly than the bigger, heavier one did, right? So as we add or take away the mass, the mass affects the, uh, the time it takes to oscillate. What's that term for the time to complete an oscillation? Time for one oscillation. Michael? The other one. Period. So period refers to the time it takes. And we represent it with the capital letter T. So the period of oscillation is the time it takes to complete one oscillation. We said it depends upon the spring constant, the thickness of the spring, thinner spring, thicker spring. It also depends on the mass. Um, we did point out this, interestingly enough. I'm going to go with this one. Um, Actually, real quick, pause. What do we call this point right here where it's not oscillating? It's just, it's just sitting there. Everything's in balance, class. Equilibrium. Yeah, translational equilibrium, or just the equilibrium point is this point specifically. But translational equilibrium, there's the, which force downward, class? The weight that's acting on the mass. And then upward, we have the force called the restorative force. And again, to create an imbalance of forces, for instance, if I lift it up, well, I just diminished the restorative force, didn't I? I provided an applied force that worked in tandem with, now there's still some restorative force. You can see it's still a little bit sprung up, but there's not very much restorative force. The weight's still there though, right? So I take my hand away, who wins? Weight, and it begins to oscillate, correct? And so uh, there's this imbalance of forces causes acceleration. In this case, since the weight was the winner, it accelerated downward. Until, as it accelerates past equilibrium, remember, it uh, is, it got its own, its own inertia coming downward, but as it passes equilibrium, restorative force is now increasing greater than weight, until at some point, restorative force is so great, it decelerates the mass to a stopping point, but by the time that's happened, there's more restorative force. So it accelerates upward, past equilibrium, until the weight decelerates it to a stopping point. Well, now weight's great, so it just keeps oscillating back and forth. What do we call the displacement from equilibrium? Either the distance, um, for instance, if here's the equilibrium point, I've lifted it about, what, about four or five centimeters? So it goes about four or five centimeters above and below that equilibrium point. What's that displacement called, anyone? The amplitude. And I, we pointed out yesterday, if I, if I stretch it out a lot, versus if I stretch it out just a little bit. Same period. So remember that the amplitude does not affect the period. Do you remember why it does not? Well, I mean, after all, if it has to go further, right, should that take longer? But there's a greater force, right? When I stretch it out greater, if I don't launch it, when I stretch it out greater, what I'm doing is I'm giving it a greater amount of force, which causes greater acceleration, which means greater speed of movement, same amount of time, though. So greater distance, but also greater speed, same amount of time for the period. 
Um, so what was that equation then for period of oscillation? Kendall, can you look it up from your notes? That's fine. It's formula for the period of oscillation. Good, 2 pi times the square root of m over k, um, where period, by the way, since it's just time class, period is just measured in, <coughs> plus you, time, so seconds, right? Remember, we said the k is going to be kilograms per second squared. Mass will be kilograms, so these kilograms and these kilograms will cancel. The per second squared that's in a denominator, it's a denominator of a denominator, right? Which makes it a numerator. And we take the square root of the seconds squared that is now in the numerator, which comes out to just seconds. Or you just memorize periods in seconds, which is probably an easier way to go. Now, Michael mentioned the term a moment ago, frequency. Frequency. What was frequency? From your notes, Michael, go ahead and read you that definition. Um, the number of oscillations per unit time. Good. Not the num amount of time for an oscillation, but the number of oscillations per unit time, or the number of oscillations per second. How would I find a frequency then, Michael? Mm. There was an equation for a pretty basic equation, but there was an equation for frequency. Um, frequency is equal to one over k. Yeah, frequency is simply the reciprocal of the period. So if period is seconds and frequency is the reciprocal, then frequency class is going to be one over seconds, right? But there was another unit I said that is the same thing as per second, and it's a better unit to use for frequency class. Hertz. Hertz. Yeah. Abbreviated HZ, H for the first initial of, or the first letter of Hertz's last name, the Z for the last letter of the name. So Hertz is how we measure frequency, and they're of course just reciprocals of each other. Now, this motion that you see here, is it periodic class? Yeah. The motion is repeating in the same lapse of time, so it's periodic motion. But because this mass is following the same path, class, this is also oscillatory. oscillatory motion. There's another category for this particular type of motion. Remember I said um, I could have an oscillatory motion if I took a broom, I just went back and forth over the same spot. Same amount of time, that would be oscillatory motion also. This oscillatory motion, though, is it caused by this variable, if you will, of my own muscular movements, it's caused by a restorative force. And in fact, it's proportional to displacement, greater restorative force with greater displacement. So there's another name, even more specific than oscillatory motion. If you write this in your notes, simple harmonic motion. Simple harmonic motion. Simple harmonic motion is oscillatory motion, so it's more specific, right? We just keep getting more and more specific. Simple harmonic motion is oscillatory motion caused by a restorative force. Oscillatory motion caused by a restorative force that is proportional to displacement. So simple harmonic motion is oscillatory motion, which is periodic motion. Not all periodic motion is oscillatory. Not all oscillatory motion is simple harmonic. But simple harmonic motion is oscillatory motion caused by restorative force, F sub R, that is proportional to displacement. Now, when I think the word harmonic, what word might we be thinking when we think harmonic? Harmonica. Okay, besides that. <laughs> Michael's like, man, that's the one I had. <laughs> I just think music in general, a harmonica certainly, but I just think music. Well, think about it. A lot of musical instruments have strings, right? Piano, for instance, violin, guitar, banjo, whatever. And when you pluck a string, it vibrates in place, back and forth over the same path. Now, there is friction at the ends, which slows it down, so it doesn't vibrate infinitely, right? Though, Audrey, you know this. If you depress the damper pedal to remove the dampers from the strings of the piano, and strike a note, it'll kind of hold itself for a while because the damper isn't there to stop the note from, from continuing. So it'll vibrate for a little while. That's oscillatory motion, isn't it? Back and forth in the same amount of time over the same path. But there's a restorative force in the string that prevents further displacement. So that's where the term simple harmonic comes from. It's used in music. Now in this case, 
it's not a vibrate. I mean, you could even do this with a, with a rubber band, right? How many have done this with rubber bands, by the way? Pull them to different tensions, if you will. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was younger, I used uh, what every kid has, right? Legos, at least they used to back in the day. And I would use Legos to secure the rubber bands in the positions I wanted and hold the rubber bands and I'd stretch them out to different tightnesses and you know, try to play music on them. And um, so, I mean, that, but the idea is that it vibrates, and as it vibrates, that produces the tone. Again, harmonic, but again, it's an oscillatory motion caused by a restorative force. That's simple harmonic. So, periodic just means it's, it takes place over the same time. That could be a lot of different things that repeat in the same amount of time. If the same time is also accomplished over the same path, it's oscillatory. And if that oscillation is caused by a restorative force, that's proportional to displacement, it's subharmonic. Okay, so they're all simple harmonic is periodic. Simple harmonic is oscillatory, just more specific. Well, let's take a look at page 151. Now, let's do some example problems now to use some of the math. We've done a lot with terms. Let's do some stuff with math here. And read example 10.4 for us, if you would. It's a long problem. Uh, Kendall, nice and loud. All right, now this is a highly unrealistic problem. First of all, the frictionless table we've talked about, it's a challenge in and of itself, right? Um, air hockey table is the best analogy I can come up with, but I mean, this is a two pound object. It's gonna make contact with the table, right? Air hockey, extreme air hockey, I guess. Um, the other problem I have is like with this spring, if you stretch it out, it pops back into place and stops moving. So we would have to have a spring that starts out like this, that you stretch further, but when you release it, it actually has room to compress and push back outward. I suppose in a perfect world it could be done, a little bit unrealistic, but we're gonna ignore all of that because we just do math, okay? And so uh, it starts off here, uh, we've got a spring that stretches three centimeters. Class, what letter do we use to represent the stretch of a spring? Okay. That's the spring constant. It's affected by the stretch, which is represented by the X. So maybe in your notes, make a note of that. Remind yourself, the X is the stretch. So the X here is three centimeters, or as we know, we're going to make 0 .030 0 meters. It says a downward force acts on it. Well, if the spring is being stretched, now again, it could just be an applied force of four newtons. But we might as well just say that that downward force class is weight, right? I mean, now my hand weighs more than probably, well, I don't know, weighs whatever. But um, four newtons, the weight pulling downward. So we'll just say the weight acting on it is four newtons. Of course, it could be other forces, I suppose. And the first part of the question asks, what is the spring constant? Well, how do I find k class? mg over x. But you understand that mg is weight. So I can just say weight over x. Well, that should be pretty easy to do there at your seats. Take the weight, divide by the x, and what is the spring constant of this particular spring? All right, newtons per meter, or you could say kilograms per second squared. We have newtons and meters given to us in the problem here. I don't think we need a uh, memory because we can just type a whole bunch of threes and it'll be really close to exact. We're going to round off to sig figs later anyway. I guess, well, since this is an answer they asked for, we do have to round to sig figs. Um, two sig figs class? 130. 130 newtons per meter. The problem continues though. We now take that spring and take it from whatever it was suspended from and we put it, attach it to an attachment point on a frictionless table. We put an object, stretch it out, and let it go back and forth. Again, use your imagination. Highly unlikely that this actually works this way, but we're going to live in a perfect world. The question says, what is the force exerted by the spring on the 9 newton object just before it's released? Remember, we pulled on the object to get it to stretch out 6 centimeters. Before we pull, it's just sitting there, right? Presumably a slightly sprung out spring. We spring it out more. That takes force to pull it. 
But where there's a force, there's an equal and opposite reaction. I'm applying a force to pull it. The spring is exerting a restorative force sideways in this case, because it's a horizontal spring now, to pull it back that way. The question is, how much is the restorative force? Make sense? Well, again, force in general is equal to kx. So the force that is needed to be applied is equal to the spring constant times the stretch. Well, you still have the spring constant on the calculator, right? But instead of stretching at three centimeters, now we're stretching the 133.3 repeating spring constant spring 0 0.06 meters or six centimeters. How much force was applied to cause that stretchage? Eight newtons of force were used. Now, if eight newtons of force were applied, what's the restorative force? Eight newtons the other way. How would I show the other way, though? Good, so negative 8.0 newtons. There's the second answer that they were looking for. The final thing said, what is the period of oscillation as it's released? So we release, and again, in the theoretical perfect world, it boing, 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 like that, okay? Frictionless table, somehow the spring works out. It doesn't compress itself completely. All right, so the question is, what's the period of oscillation? Well, what's the formula for period of a spring class, or formula for oscillation of a spring class? T equals C pi times square root That was kind of weak, okay? I didn't even know if the camera could hear you. Let's try that again, class. Formula for the period of a spring. T equals 2 pi times the square root of m over k. All right, so T equals 2 pi times the square root of m, which is the mass of the object being oscillated that is oscillating on the end, if you will, over the spring constant, which we already know is 133.3 repeating. The question is, what is the mass of the object that is being uh, oscillated here? Well, they tell us that the object is a 9 Newton object. That's not mass. That's weight. How do I get mass? Divide out gravity. So. Let's take the uh, 9, divide by the 9.8. What is the mass of the object here? Um, oh, wow. .9183 blah, blah, blah kilograms. Did you get that as well? 9 newtons divided by the 9. I think you multiplied the 9.8 the first time. All right, so we'll take this value, divide out the 133.3333333, close enough. Which it equals, we'll take the square root times 2 times pi. And what is the period of oscillation for this object? So it takes, uh, rounding off to 2 sig figs class, it takes 0.52 seconds. Remember, period or time is seconds. When I release it to go, boing, 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 each one is going to take 0.52 seconds. Now, that's about a half a second, right? How many oscillations would it complete in one second, then, if it does each of those in half a second? It would be about two, right? If I really wanted to find the frequency, though, the number of oscillations per second, I'd simply take the reciprocal. You remember the reciprocal button on your calculator? Have I taught that to you yet, Kendall? All right. So on the TI-30XA, the reciprocal button's right here above the EE. It's just one over X. And all you have to do is hit it. There's your reciprocal instantly. Um, some of you have an X to the negative 1 button as you reciprocally do answer X to the negative 1. And what is the frequency of oscillation class? I didn't ask for it, but we're just kind of adding that in there. 1.917, blah, blah, blah. We're rounded off to 1.9 frequency measured in hertz. And it's an extra answer that we went ahead and found. I mean, a little unrealistic, perhaps, but whatever. We roll with it. Questions on this? Take a look at the next example problem. A little shorter problem to read this time. Audrey? An object is attached to a spring and set in oscillatory motion. The period of oscillation is 0.5 seconds. The spring constant is 2 newtons per meter. Find A, the frequency of the oscillation, and B, the mass of the object. All right. So they tell us the period of oscillation class. How do we represent period? Capital T. Period is half a second. 
That's really quick. Look at this, the other number they give you, class. What's the other thing they give us? The spring constant. And it's only 2 newtons per meter. That is, that's lighter than my lightest spring. This is a very flimsy little spring. And it's oscillating the object in just a half a second. This must be a very small object. Make sense? Very small to be able to spring that quickly on such a light spring. So we're already kind of thinking. We're not expecting very much mass. All right, the first question it says is letter A, find the frequency. Well, how do I find frequency, class? 1 over T. 1 over T, reciprocal of the period. Well, they gave us the period. Just take the reciprocal, class. Two. Two. <laughs> yeah, we'll go 2.0 to give ourselves a second to say fig, but two um, hertz. There we go, two hertz. There's my first answer. That was easy. Part B, not so easy. Find the mass of the object. Hmm. Well, I know the spring constant, and I know the period, and I need the mass. Which equation has all three of the variables in it, class? Uh, t, t equals 2 pi times the square root of m over k. But again, I need to be able to get the m by itself. What will I do to solve for the m? Not yet. Divide the 2 pi away first. Then square everything. And then multiply the k. All right? All right, so take the period, 0.5. Divide by 2 and divide by pi. Michael's calculator, I think you can divide by 2 pi directly. When you get that number, square it. Then multiply by the spring constant, which is just 2. And that's the mass. And it's very small, like we anticipated. Class, what is the mass? Kilograms, right? Now we're going to round off to two sig figs, but I also, let's just make it grams. Right, move the decimal three places, I could round it to thirteen grams. I could say 0 0.013 kilograms, thirteen grams. Now this right here is ten grams. Okay? And so it's it's very small. Uh, so about this size, maybe a, the tiniest nudge bigger, and um, very, very tiny object on a very tiny spring that's oscillating very, very quickly. Um, I don't think this thing could even oscillate one of these springs. Like, I mean, it's, it's just wobbling now. It's not even oscillating. There's not even enough mass to do anything. So it's a very, very light, light spring in this problem. Questions on example 10.5. Do we see how we'll use the different equations? Let's do a couple more problems together now. Page 157. Page 157. And look at problem number four. Page 157, problem four. Go ahead and read that if you would, Michael. A 40 kilogram mass sum from a spring stretches the spring 87 centimeters. Find the spring constant. The mass is pulled 20 centimeters down from the equilibrium and released. What is the force exerted by the spring on a 40 kilogram mass just before it releases? And um, what is the frequency of the motion? All right. Okay, so. They give us the mass, which is 40 kilograms, and it's three sig figs, 40.0 kilograms. Uh, the stretch class, we'll represent that again with the letter x, is 87 centimeters. Let's make that 0.87, right? Move it two places, so 0 0.870 meters. And uh, it wants us to find, first of all, the spring constant. What's the equation for spring constant, anyone? Uh, mg over x. Mg over x. So I know the m. Multiply by g. Divide by the x. Wow, that's a big spring. <laughs> What is it, class? 
1.57. Yeah, around it, it's a 451 Newton per meter spring constant, or kilogram per second squared spring constant. Put this in the memory of your calculator, because the problem continues. All right, now, the mass is pulled down an additional 20 centimeters. So the stretch class is no longer 0.87 meters. What's the stretch now if there's an additional 20 centimeters of pull? 1.07 meters, right? So pull down an additional 20 centimeters. Now it's stretched out this far. This is now the x. And the question is, what is the force that the spring is exerting? What do we call the force the spring exerts, class? Restorative. The restorative force. How do we find restorative force? Yeah, the mg is usually the weight, right? But it's really the force in general that's applied. F equals kx, if you were to multiply. So restorative force, remember, is negative kx. So we'll take the spring constant we just found, but now multiply it by 1.07. And how much restorative force is in that spring once we've pulled down 20 centimeters? Rounded 482 newtons of restorative force. By the way, that 20 centimeters we pulled down class, that's called the amplitude, the displacement from equilibrium. And uh, in theory, if there were no frictional forces within the spring, it would rise another 20 centimeters above, 20 centimeters below, and so forth. So 482 newtons. Now remember, I'll put that in uh, memory two. That's a terrible box. <laughs> memory two. Now remember, um, we have 40 kilograms, right? When you multiply that by 9.8, the weight that was acting on the spring was only 392 newtons, remember? That was the mg was the 392 newtons. That's how much force stretched it this far. But when you pull it down an additional 20, you're causing restorative force to increase to this. You realize there's about 90 more newtons now up and then when, when you let go, that the weight is down, correct? Those 90 newtons of some of the forces in the Y, you divide that by 40 kilograms, what's gonna be the acceleration in the Y upward? This isn't part of the problem, this is kind of me ad-libbing here. What, what's gonna be the um, acceleration upward? 2.25. Yeah, it's gonna go up about 2.25 meters per second squared, roughly. It's gonna be used a rounded 90 difference. It's gonna be rushing upward at an accelerated rate, except that gravity's pulling down at 9.80, so it's gonna kind of offset a little bit as it goes up. And of course, as it rises, restorative force decreases until eventually it goes to nil, and then the weight wins out. There's almost no uh, minimal restorative force, I should say, upward, and it'll drop back down and continue oscillating. Let's keep going with the problem. Find the frequency of motion. So letter C, find the frequency. How do I find frequency, class? Frequency is the reciprocal of period. Oh. Only one problem. We don't know the period. So what are we going to have to do? Find the period. How do I find the period, class? 2 pi times squared of m over k. Uh, well, I know the m, that's 40. I know the k, that's memory 1. So a 40 divided by memory 1. Take the square root times 2 times pi. This thing's oscillating fast. Unless I mistyped something. Let me try this again. 40 divided by recall 1. Take the square root. There we go. That's not what I had before. Times 2 times pi. Here we go. Yes, now I've got what you're saying. 1.872, blah, blah, blah. Period measured in seconds. It's the time required for an oscillation. But they wanted frequency, so what do I do? Reciprocal. And what is the frequency of oscillation? 0.534, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's a one next. So uh, rounded 0.534 frequency measured in hertz. And there's the frequency of oscillation. Questions on this problem? 
All right, we took all that time to set up for Pendulum, and we don't have time to get to Pendulum because I have to let you go to Pizza Day. So, we will pick up with Pendulai. I'm just kidding, I think it's Pendulums. We'll pick up with Pendulums next time. Your homework for the weekend, homework for the weekend is to read over pages 152 to 156. Read over pages 152 to 156. All on page 157, answer questions 16 to 18. Page 157, answer questions 16 through 18. And do problem five. Page 157, questions 16 through 18, and do problem five. We'll look at all of that and review on Monday when we come back from the three-day weekend. We'll go over this again, and then we'll get into pendulum motion. And um, again, as I mentioned, we're looking at a lab coming up, uh, Gavin, Evan, uh, if you're watching. Um, I'm afraid the lab is just going to be too hard to record. You're not going to be able to see what we're able to see. So we're going to do the lab without you. I'm sorry. Um, it's not that I hate you. It's not that I want you to miss out. But uh, maybe you can find good YouTube videos on pendulums. But we're going to do a little bit of hands-on coming up one day next week. So uh, there will kind of be a little bit of a gap there in the lesson. All right. You all are dismissed. Have a wonderful rest of your day.